Welcome to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed Theology. My name is Camden Busey. I'm once again in Grays Lake, Illinois. And we got uh, some wonderful folks with us today. Uh, let me welcome to the program for the first uh, panelist here in line, uh, Dr. Lane Tipton, our fellow of Biblical and Systematic Theology. Uh, he is also uh, the pastor of Trinity OPC in Easton, Pennsylvania. Welcome back, Lane. It's good to see you. Thanks, Camden. Great to be here, as always, for Van Til Group. But yes, we are delighted to also have with us Carlton Wynn, who's down at the Westminster PCA in Atlanta, Georgia. Welcome back, Carlton. It's good to see you, too. Thank you, brother. I'm always happy to stand in line behind Dr. Tipton <laughs> and yourself. Yeah, well, we've been online for a little while, uh, doing more recordings, and uh, yeah, this is... This is uh, not a, not any form of a commencement or procession or anything. So we just uh, <laughs> lining up, going through the order and uh, introducing our folks. But uh, you're going to start us off today, no doubt, as we get back into Van Til's book, The Defense of the Faith. And I got my first edition copy here. Uh, wonderful uh, volume. We got some of those. I think Ryan Noah might have a few of these in stock if we didn't sell the rest of them at the Reform Forum Conference down in uh, Pflugerville, Texas. Uh, but they're floating around out there, and you can get it uh, electronically if you want the first edition to, to follow along with us. But there are other editions available as well. Uh, but these are the ones we're working through. And today we're going to be turning uh, now, eventually, to Chapter 2, where this is our sixth installment of Van Til Group. And now we find ourselves on page 40. <clears throat> and the uh, Christian Philosophy of Reality, Chapter 2, and we're going to... Lord willing, get through the first Roman numeral, eternal unity and plurality. So we've already been really cooking with Van Til and a lot of exciting things to discuss, but we're really going to get into some meat today, some very important and uh, foundational topics in Van Til's uh, thinking. But before we get started, we've got a couple things to mention. First, uh, I encourage you to head on over to the website and you go to reformedforum.org where you'll find information about all of our programs and all of our publications, our events, and our courses. And there's always new things being posted. So take a look at reformedforum.org, and you can, of course, sign up for the email newsletter to get all of our news and updates delivered uh, promptly to your email inbox. So we don't send too many emails, uh, just a couple a month. So if you head on over and subscribe, you'll be sure to be the first to know when things become available, and uh, as well as uh, receiving the best deal on uh, future books, and when we're always letting you know when the sales are and that sort of thing. So, uh, we got a new book on Van Til coming out. We're indexing Lane's book, Van Til's Trinitarian Theology. It's there, the text, it's all ready. It just needs to be indexed and then printed, and uh, we'll be able to start sending that out. Very excited about that. Very thankful for Lane's work on that, and looking forward to having that out for everyone to read very soon. So stay tuned and stay subscribed uh, to keep updated on all those things. Well, Carlton, why don't you start us off out here as we turn the page and turn the chapter now to chapter two on page 40. What is Van Til introducing now and what uh, what are we going to get into today? Yeah, thanks, Camden. Um, so glad to be back with you guys. It's been a little while since we've dipped back into this book. Uh, for those listeners who have stuck with us, uh, they will remember that in the previous chapter, Van Til has given us a preliminary look at what we believe as Reformed confessional uh, Christians. He's walked through the doctrine of God and man and uh, salvation, Christ, salvation, uh, church, last things, other topics. And, and now as we dive into chapter two, chapter two is titled, The Christian Philosophy of reality. And that word philosophy should not throw us. Van Til is going to be thoroughly biblical, revelationally grounded in what he has to say. But uh, as he turns to this chapter, he begins with these words. After we answer in preliminary fashion the question as to what we believe as Reformed Christians, we face the problem of how to get people interested in our faith. Right away, Van Til's telling us uh, that he's entering into uh, a mode of persuasion and evangelism. He wants to talk for a moment about the task of winning the hearer. And so before he gets into the discussion of a Christian philosophy of reality or a Christian theology of reality itself, uh, what is out there, um, he wants to speak principally about about strategy 
and uh, he, he, he begins to say that that people around us, or at least people in his day, generally do not have a familiarity with the theology that he's just discussed. In fact, they have a philosophical orientation uh, to what he calls the categories of God, man, and the universe. Uh, so actually the hearer is at a bit of a disadvantage, or at least the theologian and evangelist and apologist is at a bit of a disadvantage because not only do his hearers not, uh, not, um, not know much theology, uh, they in fact filter whatever they do think they know about God, man, and the universe through secular philosophical categories. So um, Van Til's going to lay out a strategy and with that strategy, a danger um, in trying to get men interested in the faith. And, and what he initially says is that um, we must make contact, and we can say more about that word because Van Til uses it in different ways at different times. We can make contact with our hearer only if we speak their language. Um, and here Van Til begins to do um, what many have misunderstood him for. He begins to take up the language of uh, the philosophers around him in order to advance a Christian understanding of reality. And maybe, Lane, maybe as we dive into this strategy, before we even get to what the Christian philosophy of reality is, uh, Lane, can you describe for us uh, the, the danger that... Um, that Van Til identifies here and the self-conscious goal that he posits for the apologist. Sure, sure. I, I think, by the way, it's great to be back for this. And thank you for that, Carlton. Um, what, what, as you said, what Van Til's doing in this chapter is he's moving from Van Til the theologian to Van Til the evangelist. Um, that's one way to try to put it. And his concern here, his macro strategy, is to restate the doctrinal content of, quote, what we believe as Reformed Christians in philosophical terms. So he's, he's seeking a philosophical restatement of the Reformed doctrine that we've just surveyed. Now, as you point out, Carlton, the danger there is in restating that you don't thoroughly critique the content in that philosophical view of the world and replace it with Christian content. But um, the safeguard against that is this, and, and I, I don't want to overstate this, but this material that he's presenting is not designed to give an alternative philosophy to an unbeliever. This is designed to share the gospel with the unbeliever uh, and to win those who have a non-Christian familiarity with the categories of God, man, and the universe. And so um, what, he's, what he's trying to help us do is self-consciously enter sympathetically in to the philosophical categories of the secularist, the person who has some familiarity with God, the world, um, and man, in terms of a, of a secular philosophical worldview, enter into that sympathetically, and then take the doctrinal content of the first chapter, and having removed the philosophical content from the terms, fill it with Christian content to try to communicate the antithesis between Christian religion summarized in the creeds and confessions of the Reformed faith with the various forms, plural, of the singular non-Christian viewpoint. Yeah, very good. Uh, maybe maybe I could quote from what he says on page 41. He's actually drawing from his syllabus on apologetics. Um, he, here's how he identifies the danger. He says, at any rate, philosophical language has to a great extent been formed under non-Christian influence. Is it not likely that then that we shall, if we use the language of the philosophers, 
also import into the Christian scheme of things the problems of philosophy as these have been formulated by non-Christian people? In other words, is the, are the philosophical terms we use going to be too sticky that they're going to bring in the baggage of unbelieving secular philosophy if we begin using these terms? Van Til goes on. The answer is that we shall be obliged to a large extent to use the language of the philosophers or we shall have no point of contact with them. But we shall have to be on our guard to put Christian content into this language that we borrow. Okay, um, maybe let me just make two quick points. Number one, very quickly, when he says we shall have no point of contact with them, I think it's fair to say that Van Til's talking about um, formal uh, agreement for the sake of intelligibility there. He, he's not talking about mutually acknowledged substantial common ground because Van Til is going to say that because of the total depravity of the unbeliever, because of the suppression of truth and unrighteousness, whatever the unbeliever acknowledges to be the case will harbor within it a hostility against God that's going to affect the content of what they mean by the terms that they use. So Van Til's saying that at that level, there is no point of contact, no matter how many similar words we use. But he wants to say, unless we use la language that is on the surface intelligible to the non-Christian, we're not going to have any meaningful, fruitful, dare we even say loving contact with the unbeliever. Second point I want to make is that in this discussion of pouring Christian content into philosophical terms for the sake of winning the hearer, I think Van Til is, is very wisely navigating between, uh, if I can recall, I think our opening uh, conversation about the criticisms that Van Til was, was dealing with from his Dutch colleagues in that journal, the Calvin Forum. If, if you remember, I think we, we landed on the terms, um, uh, the critiques that, that Van Til's Dutch colleagues were leveling against him were, we characterized as, on the one side, an infection thesis, which said that, that Van Til is allegedly hopelessly compromised by non-Christian philosophy. Uh, he's denied cardinal tenets of the faith, and the evidence for this infection thesis is his use of philosophical terms. And on the other side, other critics were invoking what we called a rejection thesis. Not an infection thesis, but a rejection thesis. Namely, that Van Til has so denied the presence of common grace, so rejected any semblance of agreement with the unbeliever, so radically insisted on the epistemological antithesis between belief and unbelief, that he's left himself on an island. He can't appeal to any quote-unquote fact when speaking with the non-Christian. So the, the charge is Van Til's either a hopelessly compromised secular philosopher or he's so insistent on his Christian um, moorings that he can have no contact with the unbeliever. And, and, and navigating around both charges, Van Til is saying, no, no, I'm using the language of the philosophers but filling it with Christian content for the sake of persuasion and evangelism. Yeah, that's 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 beautifully said, Carlton. And and I think that the um the fact that Van Til's doing this up front betrays a kind of uh, misunderstanding of what he's after because he's uh, clearly aware of the non Christian philosophies of the day and seeking to engage them. And so he's not um an intellectual Anabaptist, as it were. Uh, but on the other side, he's going to be self-consciously seeking to pour distinctively reformed content into those terms in order to critique. So he's not hopelessly compromised or infected um, it, in the language that we've used in the past. And I think that really sets up well uh, the way that Van Til's offering uh, an authentic and sympathetic and critical engagement with the philosophy of his day in terms of robust biblical and reformed confessional theological categories. Amen. Amen. Well, maybe we can, can we move back to page 40 and, and see how Van Til begins to apply this strategy? Um, back on page 40, 
um, he says there is no possibility of avoiding this this is the second paragraph we can make no contact with men unless we speak to them in their language many men in declaring that they believe in God assume that God is identical with reality and reality there has a capital R so Van Til surveying the landscape of the philosophical scene around him and he's saying they use the word God but they don't mean by that word what what we mean by that word they keep using that word but I don't think they know what it what is it whatever that line is from uh, Princess Bride, <laughs> Princess Bride. Yeah. thank you for catching think... that even though I butchered the line <laughs> uh, you keep using that word um, so it's inconceivable that Van Til would want to make common cause with their notion of God uh, because they see God, in quotes, as identical with reality, capital R. Okay, Lane, what, what's he getting at here? What does he mean by the philosophers uh, speaking of God, quote unquote, as identical with reality? Well, now we, we need to transport ourselves back on, in this particular instance to Van Til's own philosophical and theological milieu. And what he means by that language, especially given the philosophies of his day, was that many believed that God, the absolute, is nothing more than an aspect of the universe. Uh, he's the, or it, is the eternal aspect of of the space-time continuum. Uh, for instance, absolute idealists believed that when the absolute related to the world, it began to change and develop along with the world. And there, there are two versions of this. I'm going to call one an historical version and the other a logical version, just to give you some background. Uh, Hegel believed that absolute mind is developing along with and through all finite minds. And as it does so, it gains more and more universal and particular knowledge. Uh, those who are familiar at all with Hegel, a thesis generates its antithesis. And then there's a synthetic movement that brings together those things that are polarized through a dynamic, dialectical, historical process. So without getting into the details of Hegel, Hegel believed that the absolute is slowly coming to self-consciousness and is dependent on finite minds for that process of development. Bernard Bosenkat, uh, a different uh, uh, idealist uh, from a uh, British and French side, uh, he said that reality is a single system and that God supplies the eternal aspect and the world supplies the temporal aspect. And there are two aspects of one entire reality. God and the world exist in a series of logical relations in what Bosenkat called a system. God and the world are part of one logical system. And so God's existence and the world's existence are two aspects of mutually implicating realities. Now, without getting into the details of that, instead of drawing a line like Hegel does, Bosenkett draws a circle. And the, and the absolute mind for Hegel and finite minds are in a process in history moving dialectically together, developing together. For Bosenkett, the absolute and the uh, temporal, the eternal and the temporal, are part of one logical system. And Van Til's saying that whether or not you find the absolute developing along with history, Hegel, or supplying the eternal side of a system of inferential relations, like Bosenkett, both of them see reality as inclusive of God and man in some kind of mutually supportive and interdependent relationship. And so that what Van Til's saying is when people talk about God and when they talk about the universe and they talk about God's relation to the universe, they're thinking about God as being inseparable to the world and identical with its historical and inferential processes. And so 
it's it's a it's a form of of correlativism. Okay, man, you just you just gave us a mouthful of um, of philosophical history there. That was that was that was great. Um, if I, if I were to shoot from the hip and try to put it at the lowest level possible, I, I, I think of Van Til dialoguing with 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 the philosophers of of idealism, and you just gave us a, a quick run through of of the German form, which sees which sees a, a comprehensive absolute mind coming into self-consciousness through history and a British form which is a little more conceptual and uh, rational um, in, in, in that form of idealism. The, the way that I think of it, like when I first wake up in the morning and I'm really groggy, and I typically and don't you, think of think idealism about right idealism. when I wake yeah. up in the morning. <laughs> don't, don't you tell us that. You're thinking about it all the time. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, um, I think of it in terms of philosophers who want to provide a comprehensive account of, of what's out there. And they, they recognize that human experience is made up of, of many component parts. But those component parts, those instances of human experience are, are best understood, so they say, in the broadest, most comprehensive context possible. In other words, those co individual facts of human experience need to be related to their immediate, broader, and ultimate contexts, like concentric circles radiating outward from the individual self. Now, because no finite mind can comprehend the comprehensive context in which any one fact is found, they begin positing that in principle there's a comprehensive framework in which each fact is intelligible. But that comprehensive framework itself is developing either through the course of human history in the side of absolute idealism or some forms of it, or in kind of a logical progression of ideas uh, as you reach a comprehensive framework in terms of which individual component parts of the world or human experience can be interpreted. So the root problem with this, and you guys clean this up if I'm, if I'm off base here, is that as Van Til looks at these philosophies that are trying to give a comprehensive account of reality by paying attention to the individual facts, individual pieces, but seeking to relate those pieces in their most comprehensive context imaginable, here's the problem. The comprehensive framework, what, what Hegel calls the absolute, itself must pass through the sieve of temporal change and development in order to arrive at a full orbed detailed and here's a key word concrete expression that can meaningfully relate to the particulars that gave rise to it so the absolute itself is actually dependent upon the changing process that leads up to it and yet here's the contradiction the component parts are said to depend for their intelligibility on that comprehensive absolute. So you have an absolute that depends upon the unfolding particulars to emerge into its full concrete expression, but you don't have the concrete expression until it actually emerges, in which case the concrete, the, the individual particulars actually don't have a, a broader context in which they can be meaningfully understood. And you have some philosophers that take this, this internally inconsistent system and they either downplay, they like whisper uh, the unfolding part, they want to emphasize the comprehensive context, the concrete universal, the, the absolute that gives intelligibility to every particular part, and they just want to whisper the fact that it emerges through the process. Or there are some that, that emphasize the process, and they say that somehow, in principle, uh, through this hypothetical um, uh, postulate of the universal, these individual component parts can be understood. And Van Til's calling their bluff on both sides. He's saying you can't have it both ways. You can't have a universal that itself is dependent upon the particulars that are unfolding through time and space. 
and it's this atmosphere of philosophy that he's entering into and it's because we're so unfamiliar with absolute and British idealism that some of the terms that Van Til uses we say ah either he's going off in la la land or I have no idea what he's talking about that quotation there um that that uh that that we flagged where god is identical to reality um it, it's it's the that that presentation is van til's way of trying to say that whatever the absolute is whether it's the historical unfolding of mind the inferential relations of propositions in relation to some absolute or any configuration, Carlton, as you said, of, of universals and particulars, the, the point Van Til's getting at, the rock bottom point, is that the absolute needs the finite as much as the finite needs the absolute. Yeah, very well said, very well said. Well, that seems to be what the one of the principal issues is here. I love reading Van Til discussing the problem of the one and many, which we'll, we'll get into. That's what he's leading up into here in the next section on page 42, but before we get there, uh, he notices the tension that unbelieving philosophers have, that they've noticed things about the world, they notice different aspects, and they notice what, they have a an inkling of what might be some of the necessary preconditions for the world to be the way it is. But yet, because they are not regenerated and uh, unwilling to acknowledge the the creator as he has revealed himself they don't have the answer so they, they're grasping to hold things together that can't be held together any other way but by the triune god as he's revealed himself principally in scripture but also in the things that have been made of course so you can you can acknowledge in 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 a, in a sense i love the idealists from this perspective i mean they're they're getting at something that at least other philosophers won't even acknowledge. They're recognizing a problem in their conception of the world. But of course, they cannot come to the, to the proper answer because if you either go fully towards the particulars or fully toward the universal, you end up with an abstract nothing. And that's, I think, one of the, the little clever aspects when Van Til starts speaking of the concrete universal. He's co-opting a term of idealism, but he has an extremely different way of understanding that, that we have a God who is concrete, if I were to kind of just simplistically uh, uh, gloss Van Til's term, a God that exists. He's not abstract. He has existence. He does exist, yet he is also universal, which kind of doesn't make any sense uh, outside of the biblical worldview. So I, I, I love this. This is the tension. I mean, I think it's good to get in the mind and in the thoughts of the idealists here at this point to, re to recognize the, the struggle that they have and uh, the problem that they have that, that, that they uh, have not yet found the answer to and they're not going to until they repent of their sins and believe on Christ. Yeah, you know, just an insight that I wanted to, to share along these lines since we've come to that quote, God is identical with reality. I want to point something out that I think our listeners will find really interesting. What did we flag as the leitmotif under each locus that Van Til discussed, whether it's God, man, Christ, church, or salvation? It was that he kept emphasizing that God is in no sense dependent upon the created order, and the created order is at every point dependent upon the creator. And what he does that I think is so useful in his first foray to speak to the idealist, to speak to the man who understands philosophy, to the person who says, look, God and the universe are mutually interdependent. The absolute needs the finite as much as the finite needs the absolute and vice versa. He says, but it must be demonstrated that when we speak of reality, we at once make a distinction within it. Namely, the reality of God as self-sufficient and of the universe as existing by his plan, decree, creation, and providence. And he goes on to say that this distinction is going to be the programmatic distinction to which we return time and time again. And this is really 
I think, a good service to budding theologians and apologists. He's saying early on, remember everything we said about the creator-creature relation in every locus in the past? That's going to be fundamental at every point as we re-express our doctrine philosophically. It's beautiful. Lane, I, I must admit that... I- I mean, I've read Defense of the Faith before, um, but I, I, I confess that until we started walking through it like this, I did not see the consistency with which he returns to the creator-creature distinction and relation. I mean, I, I've always considered that basic to his thought, but like in terms of each unfolding chapter, he repeatedly and consistently sets that out as a non-negotiable of whatever it is that he's saying. And I find that to be very significant. Um, it, it, so isn't it kind I, of stunning, really? I mean, I'm, I agree with you, Carlton. I always, we've always known this about him, but it was inescapable uh, in the first chapter, and now he's picking right back up on it and making it the first programmatic distinction he introduces. It's, it's stunning. It, Go ahead. Yeah, it's the, it's the first thing that he says right after saying we need to use the language of the philosophers or else we won't have any contact with them he's saying right away now as you do this tiptoe very carefully and remember the creator creature distinction and relation at every point because if you lose that then then no matter how much well-intentioned linguistic sympathy you're giving you've already sold away the farm um okay well van Til wants to apply now uh what he's described he wants to take up the language, having, having, having identified the strategy and having repeated the non-negotiable, uh, distinguishing between God and everything else uh, as self-sufficient and the universe. And by the way, let me just say this. When we speak of the creator-creature distinction, we're not just affirming God's separation uh, from creation. In fact, it's not a separation at all. It's a distinction because when we draw that lower circle, it's not a brute fact. It's not a neutral, come in from nowhere, different thing. Van Til says here, we at once make a distinction, you read this, between the reality of God as self-sufficient and of the universe as existing by his plan, creation and providence. So when we say the word creation, we're invoking the entire range of God-determined, decree-governing, providentially-sustained facts of the world. Um, Just want to slide that in there. Okay, as Van Til repeats that non-negotiable, he then says that, um, that philosophers, this is down on page 41, have sought for a unified outlook on human experience, We talked about that briefly in terms of idealism. Philosophers have sought for as comprehensive a picture of the nature of reality as a whole. uh, They've thought, sorry, philosophers have sought for as comprehensive a picture of the nature of reality as a whole as man is able to obtain. But the universe is composed of many things. Man's problem is to find unity in the midst of the plurality of things. He sometimes calls this the one and many problem. Okay, um, having just identified the basic features of idealism, Lane or Camden, can you give us a one and many problem 101 description? Well, one I, and many 101. I, would, I could share at least the way Bonson does it in the Van Til's Apologetic, which was helpful to me. Uh, years ago when I was first introduced to this issue, I'll give a, a specific example. Now, this isn't a, a you know, a, a high level, you know, philosophy course example, but whenever we look at anything, we can recognize that that thing is distinct. It's its own thing. It's a particular. But yet for it to make any sense and for us to ever say anything intelligent or intelligible about it, it has to relate to other things. So one example is a blade of grass. Now you can say that that blade of grass, uh, mine now is green again. Earlier in the year it was brown and dead, 
but now it's starting to come back. So you look at a blade of grass and you say that grass is green. That's true. But the grass it has something similar to greenness, but grass is not identical to greenness. It's just a bit, we just live life this way. This isn't the language game, but we have in our minds and just in terms of the way we operate in reality, this idea that there are universals as a sort and particulars. And I don't mean universals with the capital U, that's God alone. But in order to use an is of predication uh, to, to uh, you know, give a shout out to former President Clinton, depends on the, the what the definition of the word is is. The is of predication rather than the is of identity there have to be things that are similar and things that are different. You have to have universals and you have to have particulars. Okay, so here's here's where the problem gets in terms of this predicating problem. Lane certainly can fill in and add other dimensions to this one and many problem. But if you're looking at a particular and you're trying to find out its uniqueness, so let's go in the direction of the particulars away from the commonality towards the differentiating factors. Uh, and maybe instead of grass, we'll use uh, a dog, for example. Like I had a dog as a Cairn Terrier named Warfield. So dogs are mammals, but now let's consider dogs as a specific species. Now let's consider breeds as a specific breed. And you start shedding all of the commonality. So now we get down to my specific dog and, it, and find out, well, what is distinct about him versus any other dog? Once you shed all the commonalities with any other conceivable thing in the world, you end up with what? You end up with, with something that has absolutely nothing related to anything else, which effectively is meaninglessness. Because if you have discrete and disconnected particulars, utterly disconnected particulars, it's meaningless. But if you go the other direction, you find out what is similar. Let's start with my dog, Warfield. You move back up the chain. Now you have Cairn Terriers. You have dogs. You have mammals. You have living things. You have things that exist. And you just keep going, shedding all the, descri- the, uh, the specifics. What do you end up with? An abstract thing that is no thing because it, you can't say anything about it because you've eliminated all particulars. So how do you hold these two together? That's, to me, one way that I understand. I'm I'm sure that I know that there are many other ways that people talk about this issue. But for me, that was a very helpful example and a conceptually useful example from Greg Bonson to, for someone who had no philosophical training whatsoever, to, to think, oh my, this is quite a problem. And how would people hold this together? Just to be able to speak with somebody and to make comparisons and talk and exist in the world, you have to somehow hold together the one and the many, universals and particulars. How is that done? And that's, to to me, where how Van Til is so useful and helpful in many ways, but how he does so all the while maintaining the creator-creature distinction and the intelligibility and the rationality of the universe insofar as it's based upon God without enveloping us into God to make us God as well. I mean, how would you, you had Bonson as a teacher, Lane. I mean, did, I, I imagine he might have used some other examples or flushed that out. How would yeah, you yeah. comment did, did on that? Did he bring a dog? Did he bring a dog into class or anything? To... <laughs> he didn't use a dog, but he did use the blades of grass in that book. Yeah. He, he used blades of grass. He used uh, Huey, Dewey, and Louie as individual <laughs> ducks participating in duckness. duckness. Um, and the higher you go toward the abstract concept of duckness, the, the more you go into undifferentiated generalities, the more you descend to know what makes Huey, Huey, as opposed to Dewey and Louie. You descend into that... Uh, right irreducible particularity Camden's talking about. So yeah. either you know Huey in himself in no relation to anything else. Like the ding on Absolutely Zeke, isolated right? ding on Zick. Yeah. Or you know nothing about the particular. You know only the abstract form. And so Bonson used, you know, Huey, Louie, and Dewey um, and, and Duckness as one more illustration. And um, 
And I think Camden's right on the money. I think it's the perfect illustration that you either attain an abstract knowledge devoid of any particularity or a particular understanding, a particular understanding of something devoid of all generality, of all right. relationality right. related to other things. And Van Til's saying that is the conundrum of philosophical thought, uh, particularly in its Western development. It's, it's, it plagues East as well. So I so, think it's a wonderful illustration. Would it be fair to say that if we're trying to identify the problem? in the one and many problem. It's not that we um, have a problem doing this every day when we talk about trees and cars and the grass is green right, and right, Fido's right. my dog. But but the problem enters in when we try to give a philosophical account right. of how to bring the categories, concepts, generalities of human experience and human thought into fruitful, meaningful contact with the particulars of our human experience mm -hmm. without being forced down one of two roads when we try to give an account of what those ca categories and concepts are or, or what the particulars of our human experience or of thought are. Is that where the problem lies? How would you articulate the problem? I agree with you. Uh, but I, I think that's one of the beauties of a Vantillian apologetics is because human beings don't have a problem existing in the world as God's image. I mean, they disobey him. But this is, this is the, the conundrum, right? That, that men profess one thing, but they live differently than the way they profess. So this is the whole issue when, when we will later on start to get into the actual activity of engaging in apologetic discourse with unbelievers in particular. We need to um, step upon their foundation to uh, acknowledge uh, their, their beliefs and their system for the sake of the argument in order to demonstrate its failures and inadequacies and inconsistencies. So I agree with you, Carlton. The problem isn't that people know that the one and the many are are uh, connected and uh, foundationally so. That's how we all live. It's, it's how we are. It's how the world is created. It's founded on the triune God who is one and many. <laughs> but the problem is no one, you can't explain it without that. I mean, it, it is, he is, God is. That which brings order and rationality. He is the foundation of all of existence. And nothing is without him. And to try to explain that which is without the thing that makes it that which is, there's, there's no answer to that. That's the problem. People have been grasping for this since the very beginning of, of, of uh, you know, reasoned and contemplative thought. Yeah, yeah, I, I I appreciate that. I think if listeners are are hearing us talk and and thinking, well, that may be a problem for philosophers, but it's not. Right. I, I don't really feel it. I, I my 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 encouragement would be to look at our wider culture today, and see how the loss. I, I think we're trending in a direction. Who am I? As a cultural analysis, but yeah, we're trending in a in a direction of undifferentiated particulars. Right. Uh, of 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 unrelated, unrelated particulars, particulars in the way that right. people have fallen into i mean it's like i was just looking at a book that's published on amazon right before we started recording it's learning to speak your truth and so on and so forth this your, uh, you're, by a you're not getting... cnn an analyst oh. no no this is a new book by kirsten powers no, yeah. she's a cnn I, analyst i was just she wondering you Roman Catholic. make sure you weren't getting your preaching advice from from the book called <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> How to speak your own truth. How to speak your your truth. But it's in her subtitle of her book. No, like it's very postmodern. She's speaking as a she's speaking as a she's a Roman Catholic, right. from what I understand. So, like, e even the most quote unquote sort of traditionally minded people are adopting the language of undif of unrelated particulars, oh, and oh, we're falling is. into uh, we're falling into. Right, it's just a total. A just solipsism. that example is is a, a prime example, and it and it is one place where the rubber hits the road right now. It's a complete, uh, utter rejection of just basic natural categories. God has created man and woman, male and female. He created them uh, in His image, in His likeness. He created them. That's a that's a category. That's a stop on the connection between the unity and the diversity. That is 
implanted into the very nature of the way things are. But humanity has determined, some of it in, in its sin, has rejected God's categories and rejected the way things are in favor of determining its own reality. So this is, this is just another manifestation, perhaps a philosophical one, but it has great practical implication of exchanging the truth of God for a lie and worshiping and serving the creature rather than the creator. Yeah. And, you know, I think Van Til is, on, on page 41, he says, we need to compare the totality picture of Christianity to the totality picture of non-Christian thought. And let me summarize the two basic views that I think he has that are out there. We've talked about the first one, that some people seek abstract universality at the expense of particularity. Let's call that an older rationalist model that's kind of been rejected by our culture. In place of it, there is a quest for absolute particularity, absolute individuality with no broader universal framework in view. The We could call it the triumph of the particular, not just the modern self, the particular modern self, nice. right? To, to, so, so it's the rise and triumph of the particular modern self. Now, those are abstract. In Van Til's day, the absolute idealists knew that. Now, they're, they're not slow. They said, well, we don't want that abstract universal. We don't want that unknowable particular. So what did they do? They saw it in uh, their philosophical worldview, whether it's um, uh, German, American, or British forms of absolute idealism. They sought to bring the universal or eternal the unifying principle, and the particular, the historical, into a mutually developing relationship so that there's nothing in the universal that's not expressed by the particular, and there's nothing expressed by the particular that's not in the universal. They're concrete together. The, the universal and the particular are symbiotically related in a process of development. And Van Til's looking at that and saying, okay, you've got two basic views. One, abstract universal, ultimately says nothing specific. Unknowable particular, because it's so particular, you can't relate it to anything else. That's the abstract uh, problem. The, univ the, the idealist tried to solve that and said, let's bring the universal and particular together in a process of mutual development where both are in a, a process, Van Til says, okay, time out. Let's apply our doctrine of the self-contained God to this question of the universal and particular. And he says this, um, and I believe this is on the top of page 42. He says, the first step and answering the question of the one and many problem will be, and this is just vintage Van Til, this is getting into the new the section on the eternal one and many, is to distinguish between the eternal one and many and the temporal one and many. Yes. And, and that is just a bolt out of the blue for this discussion on universals and particulars, because what the traditional discussion is doing is talking about univer abstract universals, uh, concrete particulars in experience. The idealists are trying to join them together in a symbiotic process with one another. And Van Til's saying, before you get to the temporal unity and diversity, he said, you have to consider this, that, quote, unity and diversity form a self-complete unity in the ontological trinity. And so this is going to be the beginning, the first step, in answering the question of the one and many, to make that sharp and categorical distinction between the self-contained trinity on the one side and the temporal order of creation on the other side. And he spends a stunningly an entire section here on unity and diversity within the self-contained ontological trinity that was treated in the previous section. Quite a stunning move, I think. Nice, nice. Okay, so, so, so he's saying that the answer to the dissolution of the old rationalism and the answer to the rise and triumph of the particular self 
uh, to borrow from Truman, um, is is the eternal existence of the one and the many in the ontological trinity. Can, can we start teasing out some of the distinctive features of the eternal one and many, of the one God and three persons? What what are why can he say there is an eternal one and one and many? What 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 is he interested in preserving, in order to uphold this eternal one and many as the solution to the problem of the one and the many? Well, I think the first thing, uh, Carlton, is that he says the persons of the Trinity. I'm going to use my language and then quote him are exhaustively co-equal with one another. That is, the Son and the Spirit are ontologically on par with the Father. And so this language, uh, which Van Til expands on elsewhere, he expands on this in IS Intro to Systematic Theology, chapter 17, chapters 6, 8, and 9 of the Survey of Christian Epistemology, and a number of other places. His point is this, that the Father subsists entirely as the undivided essence of God. The Son subsists entirely as the undivided essence of God. And the Spirit subsists entirely as the undivided essence of God. Yet there's one God. There are three distinct persons who distinctly are the one living and true God. And so each Trinitarian person is the fullness of the undivided essence without losing his distinct personal identity. And just to start saying it that way makes you start to think of what? The equal ultimacy of the unity of the essence and the Trinitarian persons who subsist as that undivided essence. And so yeah. um, that the, the first claim that he makes there about the uh, exhaustive co-equality of the Trinitarian persons um, being the one true and living God, that moves us so quickly into the equal ultimacy of unity and diversity, which is one of Van Til's key claims about the, the, the um, reformed philosophy of unity and diversity. It's the philosophical expression of this doctrine of consubstantiality. Sure. I think there's, it, I agree with that 100%. I think, I think it's useful also to remind people uh, that the essence of God does not exist apart from the persons. There can be a tendency, there often is, even within the Reformed world, to not hear Van Til out for what he's actually saying. And there can often be this, I think this, it's not a healthy tendency to identify the unity of God, or I should even say to identify the essence more closely with God. There is one God, three persons, yes. But people will also then very quickly sometimes say, well, the essence is the divinity and then the persons just subsist in that essence so that the essence ends up becoming a little bit more important or it's the necessary precondition to the persons existing that's that's what van til's rejecting with equal ultimacy it's not just that the persons are equally ultimate with one another but that unity and diversity so considered are equally ultimate in the triune god it's not one or many or one and then many it is the essence of God existing as three persons subsisting, mutually co-inhabiting one another, and those three persons, you know, dwelling in one another as the essence. So the essence is nothing apart from the persons. The persons are nothing apart from the essence, which all that is, is the persons existing together at, eternally as one being. So what the, we end up with the same problem as the idealist philosophers. If you prioritize the essence or the unity of God, you end up with an abstract essence and only then coming to find concrete existence and particularity, so to speak, later when we start to consider the persons. That's a That's Christianized Kim. problem. It's the Christianized version, version of the idealist problem. 
That is that is so good. And that's why just for our listeners to put a fine point on this, Camden brings this out. If you notice, I didn't say the father subsists in the essence as though it's something outside of him, but the father subsists as the essence, the undivided essence of God. There is a um there there is no initial separation or abstraction of person and essence. Camden, I think that is absolutely to the point and beautifully said. Okay, that, man, that was a great point, Camden. And I, I've got a quote that I want to read from Van Til and his syllabus on apologetics uh, that I think I think you guys are going to like because he, he gives a shout out to the aseity of the persons here. Um, that's I where I was wanting important. to go, brother. Yeah. I know, I know, I know. That's great. Uh, I... Uh, <laughs> I feel like we got a little mind meld going on here. Okay. This is what he says. There is an eternal, internal, self-conscious interaction between the three persons of the Godhead. He should say among the three persons of the Godhead if we want to be. Well, he's grading. Dutch. We'll forgive uh, him. Okay. They are co- co-substantial. Each is as much God as are the other two. Okay. That's what Lane just said. Each subsists as the essence of God. Here we go. The Son and the Spirit do not derive their being from the Father. The diversity and the unity in the Godhead are therefore equally ultimate. They are exhaustively correlative to one another and not correlative to anything else. Okay, what what I want to highlight is the Son and the Spirit do not derive their being from the Father. The diversity and the unity in the Godhead are therefore equally ultimate. Van Til is drawing a conclusion from his affirmation of the aseity of each of the persons. While the Son is eternally begotten of the Father, while the Spirit eternally proceeds from the Father and the Son, they do not derive their being from the Father as though the Father were the most divine, as though the Father were the fountain of deity or the fount of deity that eternally is communicated to the Son and the Spirit. And Van Til sees the Calvinistic affirmation of the aseity of the persons as a linchpin for the equal ultimacy of unity and diversity. Now we're going to talk about why the unity and diversity equal ultimacy is important to Van Til. He's building toward an understanding of creation and epistemology and uh, and ultimately his transcendental apologetic method. But but sticking right here on aseity, what Lane? What would you what would you add? What do you want to highlight uh, about the importance of aseity vis-a-vis equal ultimacy? Well, all, all I would like to say is that, that that is the next point that should be made, uh, and I, I so appreciate you making it. Uh, I'll, I'll simply add this point. Voss himself, in his Reformed dogmatics, denies the communication of the essence from the Father to the Son and speaks of an order of personal subsistence and speaks of the Trinitarian relations of origin as being personal distinctions without involving essential communication or communication of essence. And so I think when you talk about the concept of autothean personhood, you get the concept of both a person that has his deity from himself, because the deity, the essence, is simple, undivided, and uncommunicated, if you're following Calvin and Voss, which Van Til's doing. Uh, and at the same time, uh, you're you're affirming that 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 though each person is the essence of God from himself, is an is a subsistent who is God from himself, that there are nonetheless these personal relations of procession. The Son is generated by the Father, personally differentiated and distinguished from the Father. The Spirit personally proceeds from the Father and the Son, so that you have unity and diversity that, in Van Til's language, wind up being exhaustively correlative in a way that infinitely transcends our ability to conceive it. But that's been the tradition of Calvin, of Voss, of Van Til, um, and I think it's a a a central, distinctive, Calvinistic Trinitarian theology that Van Til's promoting here um, that that makes it stand out, I think, as uniquely Reformed 
in its conception of Trinitarian personhood. Okay. Um, I've got one interlude to insert here as we think about where Van Til's going with this. And uh, it has to do with Herman Bavink. I, I want to be part of the small but militant motley crew that draws connections between the theology of Herman Bavink and the theology of, of Van Til. <laughs> because not many people are out there doing it. Um, Everyone loves Bavink. But uh, not everyone loves Van Til these days. <laughs> There's a big, long bobbing train, but yep. they don't realize that it's connected to a big, long Van Til train. Too. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, so I pulled off this book off my shelf. This is James Eglinton's Trinity and Organism. Uh, it was his his uh, dissertation, I think. Um, yeah, I published believe so. Published in... And then revised. In, uh, right. 2012, yeah. Um, okay, page 67. He quotes Bavink. Uh, from R.D. Volume 2, pages 435 and 436. This is Bavink. There is a most profuse diversity in the cosmos, and yet in that diversity there is also a superlative kind of unity. The foundation for both diversity and unity is in God. Here is a unity that does not destroy, but rather maintains diversity, and a diversity that does not come at the expense of unity, but rather unfolds it in its richness. In virtue of this unity, the world can metaphorically be called an organism in which all the parts are connected with each other and influence each other reciprocally. So Bavink's main thesis, according to Eglinton in this book, is that God reveals analogically through creation and its history something of the equal ultimacy of unity and diversity in himself. Uh, the heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork in part by unfolding before our eyes the multifaceted glory of God that finds its archetype in the equal ultimate, equally ultimate unity and diversity of God himself. And I just wanted to lay that out there for the listener that, that Van Til is reading Bavink He's unpacking Bavink, and he's going to be applying the theology of Bavink in service of apologetics. Uh, and he does it right here as he's unfolding uh, the distinctive character of a Christian philosophy of reality. Oh, that's that's beautiful, good. brother. Uh, what, one thing that complements that, um, we've talked about the relations of subsistence, how each person subsists as the essence of God. As Camden says, the persons never for a moment exist outside of that essence. Bavink brings into view the unity and diversity in Trinitarian life. There's one other quote that Van Til has on 42. He says that the tr persons of the Trinity are mutually exhaustive of one another. Now, I know we're running up on our time limit here, so I, I won't go into great detail. But the relations of subsistence are each person being identical personal, in their persons, identical to the undivided essence of God. The relations here, this mutually exhaustive of one another, that's bringing into view relations of coherence or perichoresis, where each person indwells the other persons, even as each person subsists as the divine essence of God. And um, Francis Turretin, who I think is someone that Charles Hodge is following, that by extension Van Til is invoking, he says that two conceptual clarifications of these, these mutually exhaustive relations among the Trinitarian persons uh, are that they are in an eternal personal embrace and they mutually permeate one another. Now, without going into the detail we could go into, um, some of this is is expanded on in that book we've talked about that I'm going to be publishing with Reform Forum. But the, the point, when the two conceptions are, are brought together, the Trinitarian persons exhaustively indwell one another in such a way that without losing their personal identities, they embrace and permeate one another entirely. It's, 
It's an exhaustively interior relation of personal embrace and mutual permeation without losing personal identity. That's another way of talking about the equal ultimacy of their unity and diversity. They exhaust, if you could put it this way, they are the undivided essence of God, each person, and they mutually and exhaustively indwell one another without losing their personal identities, without their personal properties being absorbed or elided. And all of this is true, you see, uh, in, in, in the God, for, uh, page 42, in whom the one and the many are equally ultimate. How so? In these relations of subsistence and in these relations of coherence, that was taught additionally, as Carlton has said, by Bavink, by Voss, and by Calvin. It's a it's a it's a it's a well formed, reformed Trinitarian theology van till seeking to apply philosophically to non Christian worldviews. And I think that is almost entirely missed by glosses of his work. So we need to hit that as hard as we can here. All right. Well, I think uh, for that might wrap us up, at least for this installment of Van Til Group. You know, we're on, our, on page 43 at the moment. Certainly we'll revisit similar terrain next time. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to get back sooner rather than later. But uh, if we maintain our schedule here, next time we'll be on page 43 for Roman numeral 2, Temporal Unity and Plurality. So you should be able to follow along with us there. If you got any questions or comments, you can send us a note, an email at mail at reformedforum.org. That's probably the best way to do it. You can also uh, hit us up on, on uh, Twitter at Reformed Forum. Uh, or try to contact us some other way. Uh, but those are those are the best channels uh, for doing so. And again, please visit us online and, and uh, find out more information about what we're doing, how to support us at our donate page. And, and uh, just if you have any questions or comments or encouragement, we'd love to hear from you. And I do want to thank everybody for listening, and we hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center. <laughs>